All right, so welcome to a uh, Teaching Tips Live session from the Office of, Office of Digital Learning at University of Washington Tacoma. And we're here to talk about uh, open pedagogy and renewable assignments with Marissa Petrick from the University of Washington Tacoma Library. And I will let you introduce yourself, Marissa. Yeah. People watching this <laughs> probably know who I am and they don't need to know anymore, most likely. So Marissa, who are you, what do you do? <laughs> I'm Marissa Petrich. Um, I'm the Instructional Design Librarian at UW Tacoma. Part of that job entails providing support for finding, adopting, or creating open educational resources, which are free or like extremely low cost learning materials to support students and courses. And they come with a really exciting pedagogical approach um, called open pedagogy. Yeah, so I mean, I think the natural place to start this conversation is when you say open pedagogy, what do you mean or how should we understand it for the purposes of this conversation? Yeah, I think usually what I mean is a, a learning approach that invites students to contribute knowledge that is useful and usable outside of the learning environment. Uh, and that could mean a lot of different things, depending on your approach. It could mean useful and usable by a future class of different students. It could mean useful or usable by the community that you're in or your campus or, you know, something that takes students into the realm of sharing knowledge, creating knowledge and engaging with that process in a way that invites others in. And in this case, when you talk about open, I mean, some people argue for various shades of open, I guess. I kind of think if it's not open, <laughs> it's not open. So are we talking here about systems that are open to the world or can open pedagogy be employed in, in a semi-open to say one class and a further class? Yeah, I, that's, that's a really good point. I do tend to argue for shades of open and that is a place where there are different um, different perspectives all over the place. I think it depends on your purpose. Um, there are some instances where I could see maybe keeping it a little more private. I think one of the things that students and instructors value about learning spaces is the ability to not get it right in a way that doesn't have lasting repercussions. That's part of the learning process. And I think sometimes there are particularly sensitive topics that you might not want to share with the world but you may want to share uh, in other ways. So an example that I'm thinking of that would be open-ish, but not like completely open to the like world. Open might be, yeah, like, <laughs> like on the spectrum of open, yeah. not closed. <laughs> <laughs> like maybe what you want to do is you're creating an annotated bibliography that multiple course groups contribute to over several iterations of the course and future students and past students can see it grow but it's not necessarily open to the entire world. I Love would it. say that's like heading in the direction of open for sure. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And I'm not, I'm certainly not arguing <laughs> against having that kind of activity. I just want to set the stage for kind of open. And I think that's great. I mean, obviously my work as an instructional and learning designer often leads to that kind of situation and, and it makes sense. Like there's a good reason for it. So I'm not proselytizing totally open all the time, but <laughs> just wanted to think a little bit about that. Few um, people are, yeah, but there are like <laughs> lots of different opinions on that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay. Um, you mentioned in our kind of discussions before this session, uh, a model around of open pedagogy by Karen Kangil Kangalosi, Kangalosi, I don't know. I do not know how to pronounce okay. the name, but I love the chart. Yeah. <laughs> well, if Karen, if Karen is listening to this, I'm sorry Hi, for butchering your name. Um, I thought maybe you could, do you want to pull that up or I can and just share a little about that? Yeah. I think it's a nice framework for, for further consideration. I'll share, obviously, this uh, resource with everybody in the teaching tip as well. Let's see if I can go into slideshow mode, really get the full effect. There we go. Yep. So this, I mean... I think about this a lot when I think about open learning, open pedagogy. Um, it's not really any one thing. And I think that's why anyone you talk to is going to give you a different answer when you ask, what is open pedagogy? Yeah, I mean, and some of the things that I really like on this, I, I like the the emphasis on student agency. I think that's just such a big one, right? And working in the open. Yeah. And I know in my own work, 
teaching and learning in the open often entails different kinds of, I call them performance obligations, but you know, you're potentially <laughs> open to the world, right? Or potentially open to that larger group or thinking about the students in the next cohort or whatever that open arena might be. And so having that, that emphasis on student agency. Um, and I think some of these will be fairly you know, obvious to, to people, but I do wanna point out two things and just ask you a little bit about that, especially your experience at UW and working with faculty here. And one is open licenses. Yes. <laughs> what, is, what does that mean for an instructor putting something out into the open? What, you know, what should they be thinking about with licensing? Um, that is a question that can take us so many <laughs> intricate and complex places, but typically I bring it back to the phrase copyright all rights reserved, right? We, most of us know this phrase all rights reserved. We might not necessarily think of a particular series or group of rights that are being reserved, but we're, we're familiar with seeing this symbol and this phrase. Um, what you're doing if you use that is saying, all of the rights to this work belong to me. If you want access to those rights, you have to talk to me. I might be able to charge you a fee, but like assume that you have no rights. Open licensing is a some rights reserved situation where you're reserving some rights for yourself, but you're openly and freely sharing other rights, like the right to copy a work, the right to share a work, sometimes even the right to revise and amend a work with other people, no questions asked. I don't know. I, I know you have lots of experience here too, so please yeah, no, add. Yeah, no. <laughs> That's great. I mean, I think that's right. That's that. That's the that's the the way it works in the United States and in most places. Is it's you have a copyright upon creation, and then if you want to modify that, you can choose some kind of license. And I think typically it seems like what I've seen, what you do, and what I do is I use Creative Commons licenses, um, or that's what I push. There are other all I know, so they have the some rights reserved, and you have different variations. And yeah, we could spend all day, you know, just describing and working on it. But I just wanted to kind of get to the idea of there is a license whether implicit or not so it's definitely something yeah. to think about when you're putting material out there and and i have gone you know in my own work i have gone across the gamut over time i started out kind of with a cc by nc as you know whatever and pretty much i'm at the cc by or where i can the cc zero even like i'm just <laughs> done worrying about it but um clearly that isn't always the case and i think yeah. there are potentially issues to consider of ownership of the material in the first place when you're working in an institution and what you can share and I, you know, licensing can work collaboratively with cooperatively with that as well. I'm so glad you brought that up because I think about that a lot. I think a lot of times the people presenting on open are people who've been doing like I've been doing this eight or nine years. Uh, I didn't dive in to the very openest of open things like CC by, which is saying you can do whatever you want as long as you attribute me as creator or CC zero, which you mentioned, which is basically saying no rights reserved, you know, yeah. do, do whatever you want. Like almost no one starts at that openest yeah. of open ends. And I think that's okay to kind of ease your way into the Oh, the I mean, process. absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And there are real, there are real arguments to be, to be had about the different licenses. I mean, I know when I started thinking about this and was first exposed to creative commons, one of the reasons I chose a more restrictive license was just because I had it in my head, like, well, what if this is used for, for terrible purposes? What if this <laughs> image is used for a white yeah. power rally or something? Like, I would be very unhappy with that. And over time, I kind of came to realize that that's a problem, a bridge I can cross when I come to it and accommodating it philosophically. <laughs> Hopefully you never will. I want things to get used. And yeah. if, if the license is too, not even too restrictive, but if they can't understand, they can use it in that context, then it may as well not be available to them. So I've kind of drifted that way, but any starting point with any Creative Commons license is a great improvement over, I think, over standard copyright protection, which. Yeah, I mean, something I think about a lot, which is again, so many opinions, so many perspectives, so many approaches to this work. Um, we do see from time to time, I work a lot with open textbooks and open learning materials. And from time to time, we'll see a commercial publisher take an openly licensed textbook assignment, something that was licensed under CC BY or CC zero and take that content that they did not produce and put it into a package that they can sell to others, which to me feels like a pretty valid reason to use, say, a non-commercial license that will allow you to say, you can use this, you can even modify it, but you can't sell it. Yeah. 
That makes sense. And I, I seem to remember, I mean, early on or relatively early on, there was at least one company whose whole business model seemed to be that they were taking CC by material, yeah. and making supposed textbooks out of it. I know. <laughs> hey, whoa. Yeah. And but I want yeah, to put I mean, textbooks in quotes there because a compilation of materials doesn't a textbook make normally. Um, yeah. But, you know, for, for people who aren't familiar with Creative Commons licensing, essentially, you just have these kind of essentially clauses that you can add on or remove. So you have a non-commercial you just mentioned where visual can't be used commercially. You have non-derivatives where you can't make a derivative. You need to use it as it stands. The buy is the attribution, which usually is on almost every license. Um, yeah, so here's a great example. So tell us what we're seeing here. We're looking at the uh, the license. Oh, excuse me. My mail is arriving and my dog is um, commenting on oh, okay. that. <laughs> um, so if you look down here, I have the attribution for this chart, which I did not create. Uh, this, this is the diagram. This is the person that created it. And this is the license that that person selected for their work. If you click on it, the Creative Commons license is going to tell you exactly what you can and cannot do, where you have permission and where you don't. For example, this license says that you have permission to share and adapt uh, under these terms and conditions you must attribute the author yeah. excellent yeah and this has come so far remember from the early days i'm sure you remember as well uh in the explanation and and just how what happens when you click through and see that license from every yeah. perspective um and, and that's and how I, so many people learn about like you know <laughs> no one no one looking at this without the link if you don't know what a creative commons attribution 4.0 license is if there's no link there that's not at all useful. I think I started even discovering what that meant by clicking and seeing. Yeah, yeah me too, me too. Um, <laughs> yeah, and I mean, you need the attribution to be there really to be in terms of using the light of almost any Creative Commons license in the first place. And then it's nice to have that, that click through. Um, are there any kind of blanket statements that are applicable to UW faculty when it comes to their ownership of material that they, they're making, or is it really subject to many policies? I don't honestly know at UW. I don't know either. Okay. Um, and I think that's a, that is a good question to raise. Under certain conditions, you know, you might own your work, but if you're doing it as part of your job, it might be considered a work for hire where your employer owns it. Uh, I know this might... Before I was a librarian, I worked in journalism, and when I was a contractor, any photo I took, any piece that I wrote was a work for hire. I did not own it. My boss did, or my my employing organization did. Yeah. Faculty do have a lot of intellectual freedom protections that journalists don't necessarily get, um, but I don't actually know how that applies in this case. Okay, great. Um... Yeah, and we'll come back a little bit more to some of the resources later, some of the resources available to get help when you're actually doing this. So when you're really, when it's brass tacks time to talk to you and to investigate the licenses further and decide what they want to do. So thanks yeah. for, for that explanation. <laughs> um, the other thing on the open pedagogy chart by Karen that you had shared uh, there is the community participation, civic engagement. And I think this again ties to that idea of what the community might be. It doesn't mean the community is the whole world. Yeah. Uh, but when you're in your experience, when you're thinking about that community and adding to that community, which I think is one of the fundamental principles of open education, um, what kind of communities and what kind of engagement have you seen in some pro projects here or um, in your experience wherever? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of cool things that I think people are already doing. They're just not framing it as open pedagogy or as an open textbook or, or things like that. I think that you do see people bringing students out to do like citizen science that gets shared with the world. There are a number of people that have like website course projects that are public that definitely fall under this category. Um, a cool example from, gosh, just, just pre-pandemic uh, is this Telling Our Stories collection. It's a multimedia collection of stories um, that highlight student experiences at UW Tacoma specifically. Um, you know, there's there's loads of different, different ways that people can engage that are pretty neat. And this, um, hopefully we'll link to this later, but this is something that people can check yeah. out. Yeah, we'll have links to this for sure. And this is an example I've used before too, because it's just so awesome, right? Yeah, it's really good. <laughs> it's, it's, it's just really good. It's a great product. It's using a platform that's available um, to UW, the Pressbooks platform, which people would, I, 
contact you about for, at UW Tacoma yeah. uh, to use and uh, and I can help support faculty as well, designing and building there and an open book publishing platform. And just having the students really telling, like I said, telling their stories from their perspective, their individual, I, their individual kind of experiences. And also, like you said, carrying it through to the community later is simple because it's not in Canvas. It's not a discussion board in Canvas where this kind of reflection might happen, or yeah. it's not, this is something anybody can point to, it's open. And by affixing the Creative Commons license, which not only, of course, protects the work and, and expands the ability for, of access for the work, that also feeds it into the ecosystem of search engines and things that will help people find this kind of material. So I just learned just the other day from, I think, Todd Both Todd Conway at Bothell about this openverse.org search engine, which searches, I think it's openverse.org, I believe. Um, I'll put a link in the, I'll put a link in the show notes. But yeah, um, yeah I think it's openverse. And um, yeah, I think that's it. And it just, it's one of these open indexing search engines, but it combines many, many resources. So when you search, you oh, find cool. Flickr and Unsplash and all kinds of things together in one place, which is pretty awesome. And it's all based, I have to believe, based on what I see, that it's all based on searching and finding those Creative Commons licenses. So cool. People yeah. are doing such amazing stuff. Yeah, there's, I mean, this is slightly outside of the realm of what we plan to talk about, but there are so many cool tools that can help connect you with these kinds of these kinds of resources. I always am talking to people about Unpaywall, which can help people find scholarly articles oh, that are like legally uploaded as scholarly okay. articles. If you hit a paywall and you're like, I wonder if someone has shared their preprint in an institutional repository. So I don't have to pay $40 for this article. You can get this browser plugin that will check it out. That's and amazing. I've never yeah, seen this. It's, I mean, I, I am you know, very privileged to work at a well-funded R1 institution where I actually have library access to a lot of these articles already. But if I didn't, I think I'd probably use this like every day. Yeah, for sure. This is, this is great. Okay. Yeah. Um, anything else off the top of your head you want to point out as of resources that in this vein, which I'll provide links to, but we'll obviously- There are so many. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's almost hard to begin. Like, and I think okay. that's why no folks worries. like you and me like to like to talk with people because I'll always be talking to someone. I'm like, oh, for you, I would go and use yeah. this thing. Um, and for another project, I might use something else. So I, there was actually something before I pulled up on Paywall that I was going to pull up and whatever it was, I'm, I've already forgotten. What was <laughs> no worries. Okay, good. Um, yeah, there are plenty of resources out there and, and w when working individually, trying to find those things that make sense, obviously you delve down into, into different tools and, and there is such a wealth out there in, in every area, it seems. And I mean, I know that there have been, I have experienced, you know, faculty who have just been unhappy with what they're finding out there. They don't feel like it's going to work for them. And then my kind of position as well what you're creating, let's license that. So the next person who's coming along looking for it can, can, can make use of it and maybe improve it and maybe you'll make connections. I mean, another aspect of working in the open and open pedagogy that I find fascinating is that it really is a connector to community for yourself. Um, so other, other open true. educators, <laughs> other open education groups, and then other faculty and instructors and other experts and, um, you know, a large part of my career has really been built on putting things in the open and having people find it and ask me about it or use it in some way. Or build on it. Yeah. 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 And there, I mean, especially if you're creating something like an open textbook, um, which is usually a digital textbook under an open license that you can use in a course or someone else could adopt it in their course. Maybe they add a chapter. Maybe they write a course or like a lab guide to go with it. Maybe they create um assignments or test banks and like all of these things can kind of just grow the resource and expand it which is yeah. really kind of cool when you think about it yeah so one other thing before we move on a little bit to renewable assignments and more thinking about this is the relationship between open pedagogy and oer open educational resources like, yeah can you can you just talk about because i know a lot of faculty come having heard of oer and so like, yes. I want to use OER, <laughs> which doesn't necessarily mean open, open education process. You know what I mean? Yeah, uh, that, that, I, that is very true. So OER, as I said before, these are um, any course material. They can be any media type. It could be a video. It could be, uh, you know, a test bank. It could be a, a digital book or even a print book. Um, 
basically these are materials that use open licenses like this Creative Commons license that we're looking at here so that instructors can find what they want, feel free to use it, share it with their students, tailor it or customize it to their course and um, not charge students for it. So it really helps lower the cost of education in that way. These are really related concepts, but you don't necessarily need to be using an open textbook or an OER to do open pedagogy um, or vice versa. You can kind of engage with these related ideas of open when and as they're relevant to your course. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and I just, just wanted to make sure that that people are thinking about these these related concepts, but not conflating them with each other. Yeah. And of course, <laughs> especially open pedagogy has many different, um, you know, many different philosophies. It's an emerging pedagogy. And so I, I will link to some of the resources that I found and used and that you've shared um, along with this, this presentation. So people can explore that more, especially if they're, you know, theory heads and they want to get into debating the many angels on the uh, tips of pins. Uh, <laughs> open this. In which case, come hang out with me and Chris. We'll, yeah, exactly. we'll, 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 we'll talk about it. It'll be fun. <laughs> So within the, the, the realm of open pedagogy and uh, open educational resources and their use, let's talk about renewable assignments. What yes. are they? Um, yeah, because I, I, <laughs> yeah, I want to know, what, what are renewable assignments? Yeah, uh, renewable assignments, I kind of got to this idea earlier. Is the idea of an assignment that can live outside of the course that it was created for. And I, I, I love education, I love schools, I love educators, but very often what we see in a traditional assignment is it's, its purpose is to be um, evaluated by the instructor so that they can provide feedback to the student and assess their learning and help them learn more, which is a great purpose. And I don't wanna sound as though that is not a completely valid and viable thing to do. But uh, the idea of a renewable assignment, as opposed to one that, you know, it serves its perfect purpose, you get the feedback, you get the grade, you do a little learning, and then you kind of just, you can trash it, it doesn't go anywhere, um, is an assignment that continues to live after the course has ended. Um, maybe that, um, that annotated bibliography that we talked about that's going to the next class, that is continually being added to, continually being looked at if you made it public so that other scholars could see this annotated bibliography, it would even go beyond that original instructional setting. Um, so yeah, these are assignments that are designed to have a purpose outside of the classroom um, for broader communities. Excellent. So kind of renewable and reusable, but not, but they're building on each other over time rather than kind of a repurposed assignment or you know there because there are there are repurposable and renewable assignments in a sense that the next cohort does the same kind of thing together yeah. but if it's all locked behind wherever it's locked in um doesn't work so well yeah so i mean so, you could almost even think of it as like a living assignment yeah um, oh i like that yeah because i like the living documents idea as well yeah and again because to me uh, and there are obviously many ways to approach this and none of this implies one, one way is worse or not. But to me, one of the things about when I think about what I would say is a renewable assignment is that it isn't assignments that stack on top of each other either. Hmm. They may, but they're also gonna make changes with each other. So I think the open book is a great example because one model of an open book creation would be student cohort X does chapters, you know, one through five, and then the next cohort does, comes in and does six through 10. And that's great. But I think a better, even better way is to create that com community of learning through having them engage with each other. So editing, mm. responding, you know, weaving as much as layering. Um, yeah. It's my kind of philosophy of making these kinds of things valuable. Very cool. Yeah. Um, so what's been your experience with, with faculty creating renewable assignments in terms of kind of, you shared the press book uh, example, which is an excellent one. What other technologies and platforms might faculty at UW use to create renewable open assignments? There are limitless options, <laughs> as I know you well know. Um, the libraries offer a few different tools that you can use. Um, Pressbooks, which is an open book publishing um, software that we provide 
is one of them. We offer another open book publishing software called Manifold, which could also be used. You could use a free website like a Google site or um, a WordPress site. You could use, I mean, almost anything that the, the world could search for and find on the web is a possibility for, for what's out there. I know we all have our favorites that we kind of <laughs> like to like yeah, to like, hear people too. So my, but, yeah. my <laughs> hypothesis is one of my favorites just because I like mm -hmm. the idea of collaborative annotation. So I know that's yeah. one. I know. And so I like to, and the reason I pose the question this way is because there is there are the things that are within the UW umbrella kind of supported by UW IT to the degree they can um, supported potentially by the libraries of platforms you provide. And then there are the things that are outside of it. And so within the umbrella, you have press books. What was the other book publishing? Manifold. Mm -hmm. um, Manifold. You have Google sites through UW Google. Um, the confusingly named UW sites that are actually WordPress blogs. <laughs> Yes. Uh, you know, so I think those platforms are all kind of there in the umbrella. They're they're naturally open or naturally can be made open and are supported. But then without and hypothesis is is implemented within Canvas. But if you want to use this kind of tool for an open renewable assignment, then you're going to need to use the open version here. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, but anything you can is make so much fun. Like, yeah. Uh, hypothesis is so much fun because you could you can pair it with so many things like it can enhance loads of platforms that you might want to use yeah yeah because you can use it in so many different places um, mm -hmm. and certainly i think any tool like you said anything that you can build out on the open web with is potentially useful uh mm -hmm. you know so i we have a cohort we have cohorts of coil participants the international online international learning collaborations and many of them use things like padlet for conversations and discussions and they're kind of forced into the open in some cases or at least into <laughs> tools with the potential to be open because they're international cohort might not have access to Canvas or Google or some of these yeah. platforms they would otherwise commonly use, which I think is great. It prompts the thinking. Um, yeah. And then sharing is one of the benefits, right? I mean, that's right. with respect to learning management systems, they are designed to be closed only for this, this group at this university in this class. And what we like about open is that it prompts us to share and to talk and to build on one another and to do all that weaving that you were talking about. Um, so yeah, you, I mean, you want it to be a place that people can see and get to and engage with. Yeah, and a place of that you build trust and that it, that not everything can or should be open, of course, right? So this yes. isn't, I'm not promoting necessarily <laughs> going the full, I don't know, Stephen Downs, everything is open in this route, which is yes. fun if you can do it, but for most of us, <laughs> it isn't reality, uh, you know. Yeah, one thing I would say about the tools is to consider any potential barriers to users. Do they have to have an account? Is it collecting any data about the users as they visit that you might want to be conscious of? Um, you know, those kinds of things might be considerations that you come up with as you weigh the pros and cons of various different tools. Okay, yeah, great point. Absolutely. The data privacy and security is such a big one. What are you giving away? And then accessibility is another one that, yeah. you know, many platforms out there don't have the same obligation to accessibility that tools may be provided by the university do. So that can yep. pose real challenges. Um, what, what would your advice be to someone who's watching this and thinking, this is cool, renewable assignments sound great. Marissa and Chris sound like incredibly sophisticated thinkers and I must follow them <laughs> in their footsteps. What, what's kind of, what would be the first step? Like, you, you know, I think it can be intimidating to think about going open, so to speak. Um, yeah. what, what do you suggest to faculty? Um, first, this person sounds just like a very wise and intelligent person already. Taste. So yes, uh, clearly, clearly. Um, I mean, I would say that it's okay to start small. You know, it's it's okay to look at what you're doing because I do think a lot of people are already dabbling with this idea. They just don't have a name for it. Yeah. So look at what you've done or what your colleagues have done and be like, look, you know, find those opportunities for open. And it's okay to kind of take one step at a time. Um, as you're comfortable and as your comfort with working in the open grows you can work your way up to some of those maybe bigger and more involved projects um but yeah and like also there is that that thoughtfulness about when is it the moment to be open and when when is it maybe not the right choice yeah 
yeah, I mean, it can be a great spice in a dish. It doesn't have to be the whole dish. Uh, Excellent description. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes um, it is the whole dish, though. And like, yeah, I, sometimes, that's okay, yeah. too. <laughs> well, and it's interesting, the thought about what, you know, when you say that some faculty are already dabbling in this, like where I see that a lot is faculty who are thinking about community engaged learning or place based learning. Yes. And they're doing these kinds of things. They just haven't thought of it through the lens of open and what renewable assignments say or open pedagogy, how that might, you know, shift and reframe what they're already doing. Yeah. Um, and, and realizing that the community doesn't necessarily have to be just a bounded, cohesive community. It can be out there all over. I was working with an instructor who was talking about public art and his students looking at public art and they're sharing in Canvas discussion forums art that they find where they live. And, oh, and I'm, that's great. And I'm like, man, would that not be a great project to share in the open? Because all the people in those communities can contribute and go to the places and experience it for themselves. Um, and he's like, oh, I hadn't even thought about that. And, you know. Yeah. So. What an amazing mapping project that could be as well. Great idea. Yeah. And I was thinking, <laughs> yeah, I was thinking, you know, kind of oral storytelling uh, mm -hmm. with the videos and with the images. But yeah, there's so many ways you can go. And again, the tools that make this easy. Um, or at least much easier than it used to be. So talking about making video and it's like, do you work on a Mac? And he said, yeah. And they said, well, then you have, um, now it's not GarageBand. What's the video tool that's built into the, in the Mac or comes automatically with the Mac. And now I'm thinking. Uh, yeah, I should know this. I have a Mac I guess as well. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's called iMovie still at any rate, you know, you have yeah, a built-in yeah, tool that's super, super easy. Um, and, and it's not like it used to be where you needed to learn and buy a powerful editor and, and whatever you can put these things together with social media, meme generators, image editors, so much fun stuff out there to play with in the open. Yeah. Um, or to make things to work in the open uh, without <laughs> needing to be intimidated by the technology. Um, so what are some challenges that you see UW faculty or faculty in your experience when they start to build something like a renewable assignment or working in the open? What are some of the challenges that they commonly face and need to be potentially thinking about? I mean, I think in order to do it well, it does require a little time to redesign an assignment. I think this is true for redesigning any assignment, no matter how you're doing it. Often there's a waterfall effect through the course that you might need to think about if this assignment changes, does that future assignment change? Do the readings change? Um, making sure it remains cohesive through the course is one thing to consider. Um, I do think it's also important to think about that student agency piece. I'll head back to our, mm -hmm. to, to this amazing chart um, and think about, okay, Working in the open is great. Sharing is an amazing part of learning. Building is such a cool thing to invite students to do. Um, but they're obliged to do this assignment to be successful in the course. So how can you still give them agency and autonomy while you're doing that? That might be uh, something that I know Chris has talked about before, letting them use pseudonyms if they don't want that work to be searchable by their name. So like you would know their pseudonym, but the yeah. publicly assigned work wouldn't necessarily be linked to them. Um, sometimes I think that means offering alternate assignments, like maybe um, you give students the option to publish on a class website or do a presentation in class. Um, and so they can kind of choose how open they want to be. Mm -hmm. I think it's also important to think about letting students select their own license and choose their own terms for sharing the work that they've created and that they own. Yeah. And I think some of that, too, is really important in how you prepare students to even understand what they're selecting or why they're making that choice. I know I've yeah. often and typically it works in the direction, in my experience, of, of students choosing a pseudonym and later choosing they don't want the pseudonym anymore, that they want <laughs> to be attached to it. Sometimes yeah. it happens in the reverse, but I think often it's having students understand the choice they're making and what the ramifications of that are. Um, because there can be kind of extremes on both sides that aren't really true. There's the kind of digital footprint crowd that's like, everything you've ever done is out there forever. I can't find what I posted yesterday, so I don't know that how true that is. <laughs> um, and then the everything is water, it's all gone, you know, the minute you're done, that's not really necessarily true either. So having students understand what it means to have their name attached to something. Um, yeah. 
important. And then also that data piece, which is becoming more and more complicated um, in understanding foods, data and privacy. You know, typically my message and is because most of the time instructors, when I work with them, start from worrying that they can do this at all. Fear of going beyond the supported tools, if that if that's what it involved, and fear in going outside of Canvas with their students. They don't want to get in trouble, and, and rightfully so. Yeah. They don't they want to face legal challenges. But I do think the principles are fairly are fairly simple. Um, and I'm sure. And there's support too. If like if if you want another set of eyes or someone who can kind of like look for any uh, potential issues, uh, I think that there are folks on campus who will support you in doing that as well. Yeah. And I'm sure that you have, through the process of your work, become an expert in, in a lot of this as well. So this kind of ties to what I was going to ask about getting help. So on this campus, I know that if you're an instructor, you're working on a course, you want to build a renewable assignment, can they come to you? Is there a process for getting help? Should they, I mean, I know they can come to me as well. Um, what should a faculty do if they need help? Yeah, I would say, like, for me, you can absolutely come to me, and um, the easiest way to do that is just to email me, okay. um, and we can talk about assignment design, we can talk about licensing. Um, I actually really love to come and talk to students about choosing licenses and uh, how they can be autonomous. I know you mentioned before there's the, like, the internet is forever, and also the internet is ephemeral and disappears immediately, kind of opposite ends and I think it's important to remember that it's not our place to decide on a student's behalf where Absolutely. in that spectrum that they fall so um, I love to start talking to students about how to own their work as creators and what that means for other work that they might find on the internet and want to use can you do it should you do it how can you do it in a way that's respectful so yeah, yeah get in touch. <laughs> yeah, excellent. Yeah, and we'll have that information um, anywhere you see the video as well as, as at the end. Um, and same with me, they can come to me. There's, you know, I'll provide all that contact information. But like you, I find these to be some of the most enjoyable conversations because it's more interesting than a lot of the routine things that I, I do. But also it's so generative in, in thinking, like just the thought of thinking about creating a renewable as assignment means engaging a thought process about creativity and agency and, and just a different way of what assessment might look like and what that yeah. that does. And so, you know, someone who's doing maybe a very a great class with traditional kind of assessments, high stakes assessments at the end, things like that, you start thinking about other approaches and that can be really fruitful. And again, I think as a better student experience and when students have agency and contribution, the education makes more sense to them and it's more mm -hmm. you know, relevant to them as opposed to top down, which makes a lot of sense to me, especially at a place like UW Tacoma, highly diverse group of students in, in many, many ways. Um, and having a classroom experience, having a learning experience that actually seems relevant to them is obviously better. And it isn't always clear how things are relevant within a particular uh, community or group in some classes. Yeah, sometimes it trickles in later. That's <laughs> Very yeah, true. yeah. Or sometimes it comes in as a uh, resistance slash resentment cycle <laughs> as well, which I, I hate to see. Right. Um, so many ways, many ways you can go uh, with this. So that's great. I, I'm I'm excited about seeing some faculty uh, do this. We do offer as part of the Passport to Teaching Excellence program, we will have a stamp so you can stamp your way to the on the I guess I'll call it I hate to call it an island because it's so open. On the vast <laughs> planet of uh, open teaching and learning, which is one of the areas, you can get a stamp in uh, renewable assignments, which will include kind of just sharing how you're understanding open pedagogy and what you would like to do to create an open assignment, what that would look like in implementation. So information about that will be with the video as well. So any uh, parting, parting thoughts for instructors or anything that I've missed in my questioning here that you might want to bring up or or sage um, advice from the trenches or <laughs> <laughs> um only to say that i think that this work because it is always growing can be really exciting um for you and for students and so if you've been on the fence and it does i think it does really seem scary uh, when you're sort of thinking about starting just try one thing and then next quarter try one more thing and um it really does get less scary and more empowering the more you do it. 
Great. Yeah. That's great advice. That's usually my advice too, which is kind of, <laughs> don't be afraid. Just try it. This mm-hmm. is, none of this is written in stone and none of this is going to be, you know, sometimes things don't work. Like don't be afraid to fail. It might not, you know, it might not work. And I think I've seen open, open teaching and learning kind of fail in various ways, <laughs> technological or whether it's pedagogical or whether it happens to be that student cohort, it's okay. Yeah. Right. And then you make it better the next time. People learn a lot from those failures and as do the, the, the learners. So, yeah, I'll come out and say, I have learned a lot from my failures in this area. <laughs> That's, and yeah. I'm happy to share what I have learned with anyone listening, but yes, it, it happens. Absolutely. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. Great. Well, thanks, Marissa. I really appreciate you taking the time. I know you're busy, um, but to talk about this and share your experience, I'm, I'm really grateful for it. And I'm sure anybody watching this video will be as well. Excellent. Thanks for having me. Yep. Yeah.